discussion, which we'll get into, and then we're going to get some um, definitions so we are all on the same page. And then we're going to talk about some great artists that have used um, art as a type of therapy. Then, of course, going into art therapy and a few more definitions, at-home healers, and this is where we get into more of what my event was like. And then, conclusion, words for Picasso and everybody's favorite part, the work cited. So, first we're going to start with our essential question. So this was really hard to come up with because there's so many different wordings. But after a while, we decided that this was the correct wording. And it's, Does art have a healing effect on individuals struggling with mental health and cognitive impairments? So what does that mean? So of course, that's an umbrella term. But we're going to start when we talk about mental health. Right now, you can generalize and think about depression, anxiety. And with cognitive impairments, we're going to talk about Alzheimer's and dementia, um, which is a memory loss um, disease. All right, the artists. So these are two of my favorites, and I cannot wait to share. Uh, we have Vincent Van Gogh, who was born on March 30th, 1853, and uh, passed away, sadly, by his own hand on July 29th, 1890. Um, he's most known for his post-impressionism, but he's also experimented with uh, many other that, uh, styles that are not as well known. But of course, Pablo Picasso is a lot more complicated. He was born on October 25th, 1881, mm -hmm. and passed away on April 8th, 1973. He experimented with cubism, surrealism, expressionism, among many, many others, which we'll get into that a little bit more. All right, starting with Starry Night. So this was painted in 1889. Um, when you look at it, it's probably seen in art rooms and bedrooms and everything all over the United States. But there's a lot more of a somber story that goes along with that. The Starry Night really depicted the beginning of the end of Vincent Van Gogh's life. Um, as you know, he does he did end up ending his own life. And um, but the start when he painted the Starry Night, he was in a mental hospital in um, France. And what the doctor started to notice is a lot darker colors and more ethereal, dreamlike appearance to his art. They think this is doing has something to do with God complex that he was struggling with as he was planning the end of his life, which is very somber. But if you see pictures a lot before, especially the sunflowers, you'll see a lot more bright and airy tones. But as the end of his life, you start to see that dark, ethereal, sad um, topic and colors. Pablo Picasso obviously has a really a lot better story, but equally as sad. Um, painted in late 1903, the old guitarist is one of my favorites, and also marks the beginning of the Blue Period. Um, just like the name describes, the Blue Period has a lot of darker blue tones, but it also has really sad subjects. In this uh, painting, this old guitarist, we see a man that was um, Picasso himself has said is an old blind man playing guitar. Or to get money to get his next meal or his house. At the time, Picasso himself was dealing with a lot of financial issues along with mental issues. Um, as you can see, which is very interesting, below if we see an x-ray vision of Picasso's um, old, the old guitars, we see that there's a woman underneath it. This is no one knows who this is painted by, why it was painted over, or who it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, a lot of people think that um, because of the death of Carlos Casimus, he painted over a lot of his more joyful work to say this is the reality, this is what depression is, which is a really sad way of viewing it. But as we know, he goes on to live in the Rose period, which was a beautiful period of a lot more lighthearted, though there was some sad subjects. There was a, there was a lot more lighthearted. So this brings us into art therapy. We see. Back in the day, the colors had a really big impact on how artists translated uh, their work to viewers. And that today, we see that in art therapy. So the, defi the official definition of art therapy by the American Art Therapy Association is art therapy is an integrative mental health and human service profession that enriches the lives of individuals, families, and communities through active art making, creative process, applied, psych applied psychological theory, and human experiences within psychotherapeutic relationships. So what does 
art mean? This was a question that when I first presented um, was asked a lot. So in the next slide, we're going to get into the frontiers in psychology study, which is absolutely amazing. But they break down art and art therapy to mean painting, drawing, specifically blind drawing, spiral drawing, and blue drawing, but also music and drama, dance, writing, and self-portraits. So what we know, there is sadly so little information about art therapy, and if it works and if it doesn't, because it's such a personal and mental thing that it's hard to express. But this study from Psycho uh, Frontiers in Psychology got as many researchers as they could get together to come up with this um, study, and this is kind of the conclusions that they came to. So first we have art therapy has been shown to alleviate symptoms of anxiety and depression. So some examples of that might be fear, stress, social anxiety. Of course, we're talking on a big, a way bigger um, scale. So it's not just a little fear, it's not just a little stress. We're talking about anxiety and depression. Um, art therapy has been and is being used as an intervention method for those suffering from diagnosed cognitive ailments, such as, but not limited to, dementia and Alzheimer's. So this actually hit really home when I read this for me. Because when I was in sixth grade, my mother suffered from a grand mal seizure that where she lost a lot of her memory. Um, in that stage of my life, we got a lot of music and art to really gain back not only her muscle memory, but her brain memory. So we did a lot of Beatles, a lot of Elton John, a lot of um, music that could help relate feelings. And since then, I've even seen a difference in my mom's work that has been so beautiful to see with the colors and a lot more. And I just look it up if you'd like to. Um, Next, we have art therapy has also been used to initiate or serve as a communication tool for those with autism spectrum disorder. Um, this does not surprise me. We can see, and um, Van Gogh, obviously we do not know if he has ASD. We don't know. He was in the 1800s. But we did see that he used art as an expression tool, as colors. The doctors saw how his painting changed, how his colors changed, and the impact that that had. And so the fact that it's being used today with with the history of it is so beautiful in my opinion. Um, art therapy has also been noted to help with issues regarding esteem, emotional expression, and even self-awareness, which I think is such a big deal. And I am one of those people who really has had struggles with esteem, expression, and self-awareness, and I cannot express how much art has helped me deal with those issues and express those issues and find a new sense for myself. So now we're going to talk about the art show and some of my own healers with local artists. So there's a trigger warning because we're not going into any details of anything, but we're just going to mention a few things. Um, so, the Art of Healing Art of Healing. Um, an art, it was an art show here at Craftsbury made up of eight local artists who were absolutely amazing, who believed that art impacted their unique healing journey. Um, it was great hearing the stories. Um, there were so many so many different stories, but they were all so unique and so personal. Um, subject matters range from anxiety, depression, eating disorders, sexual abuse, and identity crisis. So meet the artists, a lot of whom are in this room. Um, we have Monique Puppet Dead, my mama, Raina Stone, my second mama, and my um, art, and my mentor. Martin Bressy, who you guys knew was Wade Bressy, um, Adrian Malaski, uh, WCB, uh, Danny Nelson of Sterling, our own Ruth Krebs, and me. Natalie and Raina time. <laughs> so the mentor hours were very interesting because Raina and I did have a relationship beforehand. Um, we were very we we started to get closer during this time, and because the subject matter was so deep, we really had to get a vulnerability with each other that we didn't. I, I hadn't really gotten there before with somebody. A lot of that honesty was needed in this project. I learned a lot about graphic design and marketing. Um, if you see The Art of Healing, you'll probably see the same fonts, the same logo, same everything, which I'm very proud of, even the same colors. Um, learning about that, we learned about that really, it was another great part of that is Raina being a small business owner. And so I got to really get some really good intels on that. Finding artists and storytelling, learning how to tell a story and hit those notes that are really important without over-adding or excluding important 
parts were really a main takeaway from this experience. Um, there's a lot of tears, because again, we're talking about deep stuff, but there's also a lot of laughs. And I think finding joy and pain and not thinking them as opposites was really a healing experience. And of course, healing. Growing, healing, and sharing. So this is what I would give advice for past me, but also for rising seniors that would do this project. Um, I would say communication is key for both the mentors, teachers, and um, students. Be honest, be clear. If you're struggling, you're struggling, and there's nothing you can do about that. But there can be a path to recovery. And that was something that I struggled with a lot this year, but I saw that path, and it was really, I'm really grateful for it. Um, there's a lot of, on, again, honesty, transparency, so, so, so important. Keeping that, you know, I'm struggling with this, okay, how can we get there? That was so important. Same with deadlines. With those deadlines, we needed them because I was behind. I fall behind a lot. Um, creating personal deadlines is something I would really recommend, even if that's before or after the official deadline, just do your best. Um, this is something that I think is really important. For a project like mine, um, find something you love, but try to find someone you love. I love Raina. I loved my project. And I wouldn't have been able to do this without the, that love that I have for everything in between. Um, do what will make you proud. I didn't get graded for the exhibit. I didn't get credit, credit for the marketing. I didn't do any of that, but I made myself proud. I was really proud of what I did. And I think that that's one of the most important parts. And that's something I really learned through this experience is I'm really proud of what I did. Whatever my grade is, whatever my score is, whatever other people think, I made myself proud. And inspiration usually comes in the small, insignificant, boring things to start there. And actually, funnily, funnily enough, I learned this when I was with Jake and last year. And we were, I was doing my photography, so I was even going to talk about you today, which is so funny. But I learned that last year when I was doing um, my projects with Wonder Arts. And I have that grew into this project today. So my conclusion, I wanted to make a long conclusion about what art is and if art is healing, but there's no answer to that. We're all unique and we all have things that make us tick. So I put in three words, art creates healing. You are healing, but there is a path to that. And if that path creates art, that has art in it, then that's your path. I believe that everyone should try it because it helped me and I'm really proud of it. Um, of course, I want to give a thank you to everyone who was a part of the Art of Healing and everyone who attended or was an artist. And then, of course, the big thank you to Raina for not only being, um, going to love you, but not only being an amazing mentor, but also a safe place and a guardian. And I can't express enough. So last but not least, we have this quote I'm going to leave you with Picasso. It says, art washes away from the soul the dust of everyday life. And now everyone share a part. We're excited. such an important part of my healing journey. So I don't think it needs to be visual. I don't think you need to prove like this is my work to somebody. I think if you you are, if you feel like you're healed, if you feel like this is helping, then that's all that matters. So I don't think it being on paper or visual matters or even audible. Yeah. Building off that, um, I 
has there been a, like a specific medium that's been surprising for you? Like you mentioned music, yes. you mentioned painting. Has there been a surprise in there? Somewhere? Yes. So drama. <laughs> that was actually a shock for me when I found out that that could be used as healing. Because when I think of it and my experience with it, I've been through LCP, I've done shows here. Um, you're pretending to be somebody else. So I didn't really see that as a healing experience. But the more that I, I'm teaching a, actually a theater class at Wolfgate right now. And I love it. It's great. We're doing a play on May 18th. But um, seeing the kids apply what they're learning from the character to real life, mm -hmm. that was such a weird, because once you start a project, and I think most of the seniors can say this, you're going to see your project everywhere. Everywhere you go, you'll see your project, and it's hard. <laughs> but you, when I started that with my kiddos, and it was such, that was such a shock. It's, another one is printmaking. Mm -hmm. That was really a huge, I love that's been such a fun experience, and I would that I would recommend that. Um, but yeah, I think drama is like the most. I was like, wow, I didn't realize that this was had. I found it fun, but it wasn't healing. But seeing how it is for my kiddos, and actually how it was for me when I did it, it's such a great experience. That's been really cool. Cool. Any others? Yeah. Sure. Um. So those two pieces of art from Van Gogh and Picasso. Yeah. Are those pieces of art that you that you have loved for a while, or is it something that you discovered? No, I've loved these forever. And so I'm curious, <laughs> when you saw those, did you almost spontaneously relate to them oh, as yeah. well, emotionally before you even read about the context? Oh, yeah, well, sorry, and I, I mean, again, I think everyone has seen that at one point or another. Yeah. I grew up with my mom being an artist, uh -huh. so I was kind of, even if she didn't mean to, I was exposed to that kind of thing. And it was in my art room, I remember when I was in elementary school, Story Night specifically, and I loved it. And I always thought that was so unique, and I always tried to do the little strokes and stuff, and I thought it was printmaking for a long time, like you talked about, but it, it's not, it's painting. So learning techniques has been such a cool experience. Yeah. And I, but that, because I was so young, I don't know, you know, because it's been in my life for so long. But I can, I can firmly say about Picasso, I remember the first moment I saw it, because I was in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. I was in a Spanish project, we had to do, I chose art, and we had to do a history project, and I chose Picasso. And I saw that one, and I knew Picasso's story just by looking at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, yeah. I could relate to it to my home life, I could relate it to it as an artist, like seeing what that artist was going through. Yeah. I could feel it, and I could, it gave me goosebumps almost. Mm -hmm. So learning about it more extensively. Like the woman underneath, like who knew? I have no clue. But yeah. Did I answer that? I feel like yeah. Okay. yeah definitely. Any others? I'll ask one. Oh. Do you think it's um? Do you think that art is therapeutic in the sense that of the finished product at the end, or the act of doing it? The act of or doing it. The more so. Okay. I mean, seeing it at the end is beautiful and okay. special. But for well, I'm just gonna speak for me because I don't know what. Every, every, again, everybody's healing experience is so unique. Um, for me, it's the act of doing it. And that deep breath that I get to take afterwards, that's, that's, examining what I've done is also very, I think it helps with the medium. I think the medium becomes, too. But, yeah. Any others? Oh. I do want to give you kudos or, oh, did you have a question? I have like one other one question. Other question. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. might even just be less of a question and just like a train of thought to explore yeah. in the future too. But um, with with Grace and the outsider art history, um, there's so much that's about, like it, it's about making art with folks who have had no formal training. And that's sort of yeah. like a specific thing. It's like almost you have to avoid having any formal training um, because we're so used to teaching and correcting mm -hmm. or yeah. or guiding and so so it almost like it's almost uh yeah harder within our world to yeah. to avoid formal training but i was kind of wondering as that comes into um into art therapy you know the i was just thinking about the technical yeah. versus the sort of untechnical like um, say no technical skill mm -hmm. and what might be more effective um, or what the research, like what the 
specific psychology research might yeah. say about, um, you know, impact. It's like, do, 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 I, and actually I would wonder, does someone with a lot of art experience experience the therapeutic effects in the same way that someone with no art experience? And do they, you know, in, with the same two-hour session or whatever, yeah. therapy session, are they gaining the same things from it? Do they have a different experience of it? Does the person who has no technical background yeah. actually maybe get more therapeutic effect? Um, so I'm not, I don't know, I'm not necessarily saying you should know the answer to that, but yeah. maybe it's a well, line of inquiry. Definitely that's something I want to know. Mm -hmm. But again, like with the little research, like it's, like yeah. when I say it's scarily little, like yeah. there's like none. And like everything that I could find was in this article. That's why I just cited the article mm -hmm. because it's um, a great, it was a great review and it was, they came to as far as a conclusion as possible. Mm -hmm. um, actually in the last about five years, especially with COVID, art therapy research has gone like woo. Yeah. So I would be curious to see if cool. that is something that's out there. I'd love yeah. to know that as well. I think that there would be benefit for both having my own experience as I have been in art classes and have taken training and we even had, when I was growing up, we had new models in the home. So I started art from four or five, very young. And each piece, like I have never done a piece representing trauma before. I've never, I've used it in a different manner. So for me, with that experience, I went off the rails with something yep. completely different. I used a medium that I'd never used before because as a trained artist, I wanted to throw everything out the window. I just wanted to just do what felt right. Yeah. And I think that there's a healing balance for both. I think that that just opens up, art opens up so many doors for people who can't show it in other ways. Yeah, yeah thank you. See, I've chosen to do my senior project on landscaping. So we will get right into it. All right, so quick overview. First, I'm gonna give a little introduction with my essential question and a little bit of a definition me and my mentor Nick came up with for landscaping. Then I'm gonna be going over a couple of the tools of the trade that we most commonly use. After that, we're gonna talk a little bit about the planning aspects. And then after that, we're going to be talking about like massing materials, like where they go, all that kind of stuff, storage, and some other helpful tips. Then we're going to be going over getting the job actually done, that's my favorite part. And then we're going to be talking a little bit about our field research that me and Nick did. And uh, then after that, we'll... Uh, oh, we'll back on. Nothing happened. Let me just point it out. Oh, I'm off to a bad start already, all right. Uh, then we're going to hit my little conclusion at the end. All right, so first things first. My essential question, according to common belief, is landscaping an easy job? Now, this essential question I came up with a little bit after uh, I already started my senior project, but I kind of wanted to tweak it just a little bit because of this conversation I had with a couple of my peers here at school. We were talking about a couple of different trades, uh, welding, carpenter, like being a carpenter and all that, and I brought up landscaping. and. One of my friends made a little remark that kind of made me a little bit upset. And they said that landscaping is an easy job and, you know, that's just for the dumb people. So I'm here today to show you that it is most certainly not. All right, so first, a quick little definition about what landscaping actually is. So landscaping is considered the art and craft of using flora and other natural elements in order to add to the surrounding landscapes to elevate its natural beauty. All right, so now for the, uh, we're going to be going over a couple of tools that we, that we will, or that I've been using in my past landscaping experiences, and for the part that you've all been waiting for, I'm sure, shovels. <laughs> all right, so first up, on the left side, we had the scoop shovel, and during my couple of years working with Stuart, we've been using scoop shovels to pick up any loose materials. So this includes things like wood chips, small stones, basically anything loose that's nice and easy to pick up. Now, the best thing about this shovel is that it actually has edges that come up and around, so you can actually pick up everything and nothing ever falls off. Now, down below, I'm sure, as you can recognize, uh, that there is a regular shovel. Now, <laughs> now, these are really important because we do a lot of digging. Now, that's pretty self-explanatory. Now, up on the top right, 
is a straight blade nursery spade. Now this is my personal favorite because of its full metal construction, a sharp blade on the edge, and that it actually has, well it's a name, but it's a straight blade. Therefore you can actually cut nice and straight lines when you're doing anything from working with paths to working on edging, just about anything. And it's really important because with you know this type of shovel you gotta really spend a lot of time in that dead straight. All right, so now we're going to be talking about some different types of shears that we use commonly in the landscaping business. Uh, first off, hedge trimmers. Now, as the name implies, we use these to trim all the hedges and stuff, and they're really, they're really good at doing their job. Now, they have a long, long edge on them, and that's for actually getting a nice, dead, straight hedge. And most important thing about that is that you know you don't really want to spend a lot of time with something like a pruner trying to do that because it just never looks too good. Now second off, the pruners. Now this is the landscaper's best friend. Now these you won't really be caught dead without you know having pear on on you, especially at the nursery. Now when talking about maintenance, it's very important to keep your tools well maintained. Uh, I'm sure, as any landscaper will tell you, and especially us back at Stuart LaPointe's Nursery back in the day, um, not having well-maintained pruners is just it's awful. Now, I remember stories about from me and Nick working with a lot of Christmas trees, which have that really sticky sap, where they get so sticky to the point where at the end of the day, you can't even put the things down. If you put the hand like that, they won't even fall off. So it's really important to keep them well-maintained. Speaking about maintaining, I have a great example, my personal favorite brand, Fiskars. <laughs> um, but when keeping them well maintained, it's important to keep these very sharp. Now what you want to do in, to sharpen these is you want to take some sort of file, and this could be like a whetstone, this could be a diamond file, any sort of file, just to really sharpen them up. And you want to take them along the blade edge, and that's this edge, not this edge. And you want to take them around this blade edge, and you really want to get the angle nice and well, and you really want to move in a downward motion right off towards, and you really want to knock off any of the burrs and get it all sharpened up. Now speaking about burrs, what you then want to do is flip the pruners over, and then keep this, your file, flat to the blade, and you want to knock off any burrs that you just really created. Now this will give you a nice, really sharp edge that's perfect for cutting through anything from like quarter inch to an inch worth of you know, wood twigs, branches, just about anything you really need. And then as far as cleaning go, what we commonly did is we commonly used anything from like alcohol, just basically anything that gets them nice and clean. You really want to make sure that all sap and all residue is off of it, because otherwise they'll just rust up and they won't function anymore. The next we're going to be talking about planning. Okay, so first off, what you want to do is you want to meet with the landowner to discuss the project. Now this can be done over the phone, this can be done in person, preferably over a cup of tea. <laughs> but then what you want to do is you want to go over a basic rough idea about what they want, they want as a project. And in this meeting you just want to discuss like everything from like types of plants that they want to where they want them, kind of everything like that. Then what you want to do, and this is one of the most important steps, is to visualize the project on site with the landowner. So commonly you want to walk around and you want to point out where plants should go and where they want them to go. And then as a landscaper, it is your duty to kind of tell them that, oh, this plant won't, won't work there. So for example, if I'm seeing a lot of coniferous trees, I know that the soil is pretty acidic there. So I don't really want to put any you know, maple trees or anything in there because they may not grow too well. Or if I'm noticing some real sandy soil, trees aren't going to really want to grow there because it's going to be really dry. And then after you're done visualizing the project on site with them, you really want to talk about time frames. Now this can just be a quick little conversation about like how long you expect the job to take, what time, time of year you want the job to be done. For example, like most planning should be done early spring and all that. Trees can be done throughout the summer. It just really depends. And then you want to go over finances. Now, when talking about finances, is you really want to get like the numbers right on them. For example, 
for labor, it costs fifty to eighty dollars depending on where you are. So for example, around here you're probably gonna get fifty dollars per hour. And then like places like Burlington or Stowe, some of the richer areas, you're probably gonna be able to get eighty bucks an hour for each person. Now with equipment, this adds on a bit of cost. So ninety to hundred bucks for anything involving like tractors, rotor fillers, anything like that. Including like weed whacker, lawnmower, all those. And then we're talking about plants with any landowner, you really want to be able to explain what they're actually paying for. For example, deciduous trees, $80 to $130 per cow per inch. Now what a cow per inch is, is six feet off the root ball. We take a measurement with any sort of measuring device to see how wide the tree is. And then we go off per inch. So like if you have a two inch maple tree, it's going to cost you, you know, 160 to 260 bucks generally rule of thumb. As for evergreens, how we price those out is it's $40 per foot. So this is just taken off, the measurement is taken off the root ball. So like a six foot tree is going to cost you 240 bucks. And, uh, but the price does get, you know, it does increase after, you know, if you're getting a 12 foot evergreen tree, it's going to increase a lot. Now I'm talking about shrubs or anything, you're going to pay about $30 per foot. Now this could be considering like height or spread because different plants grow differently. And a couple of good examples are rhododendrons and lilac bushes. Those are a couple of common ones we sold. And after this, perennials are twenty to twenty-five dollars per gallon bucket. And that's pretty self-explanatory. But a couple of good examples of this is New England osters, day daylilies, lupins, peonies, those kind of things. All right, so let's go over a couple of common materials that we'd be using. So first off, landscaping fabric. Now what landscaping fabric does is it provides a barrier for weeds, so weeds don't really grow up through it. And sometimes this has to be replaced, but it's real common material that we like using. Now it allows water to go through and come up. So yeah, it's really important. And then secondly, brick. So when we're talking about pathways and stuff, very common material, brick. And I'm kind of forgetting what kind of pattern this is, but that's very common in our trade. Now what we want to do with brick is you want to stamp it, stamp out soil all nice and flat. Then you put in a layer of sand, and then you use a flattener and you go around and flatten that out. And then after that, you roll out some landscaping fabric to really kind of lock it in. And then after that, you lay all your bricks down. And once all the bricks are laid out, you then sweep in sand, grout, just about anything to really lock those bricks in, because you don't want them to move. Another really common material for especially walkways is our flagstones. Now this is kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. You kind of follow the same steps as bricks. So first off, stamp everything flat, landscaping fabric. Then you lay your flagstones down and try and make everything look nice, kind of puzzle them together. And then you go back with some filler and you sweep that all in. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about some flowers, and it's important to keep species in mind. Because you want you know, the species to kind of match up. You have to know what kind of species do well. You have to know what kind of species do well in like, different soils and that stuff. Uh, then you want to think about some contemplating, or some complementing colors. So for example, some good complementing colors, red, white, blue. You don't want anything too out of the ordinary. You just want everything to kind of match up and look really nice. Except if you're English. Uh, then another really important thing when... Uh, that was supposed to be funny. Uh, I guess it wasn't, but... Um, <laughs> All right, but another really important thing when considering types of flowers is you want to pay attention to the different textures. And this could be textures of leaves, the actual petals of the flowers, that sort of stuff. And then a really important thing when picking out flowers is height differences. Now, when regarding height differences, you really want to make sure like flowers within the same bed are all within the same range, because you don't want flowers to grow up higher than the other ones, so they just overshadow and you can't really see those other flowers. So moving on, we're going to be talking about some of the materials, or like how to put materials where and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so first off, uh, collecting all the materials. 
So typically what you want to do is when you're collecting all the materials, you want to make sure that the trailer and the truck are evenly loaded, and you want to make sure nothing's going to move around. So small flowers and kind of delicate things should be most likely placed in the back of a truck where they're out of the wind, where they're protected from the wind, and so they're not going to get knocked around. And this could be like anything from like little peonies to anything like that, little shrubs. You want to make sure that they're all well tucked away. And then when regarding like trees and big flagstones and other stones, those can go in a trailer. Now one of the most important things about trees specifically is to protect them against wind whipping. Now what we usually did to protect them against wind whipping once we loaded them up is we used to put, uh, I'm forgetting the term right now, but it's more of a landscaping tarp and it allows some wind to pass through. It's pretty heavy and you kind of tie it down to the trailer and you make sure that your leaves don't get you know, torn off in the wind, or that you don't break any branches in the wind. And that's really important. Next, let's talk about some safety and some concerns for loading up everything. Now, when dealing with some pretty big trees, it's really important to be safe. Now, here's a picture of a tractor that we use a lot. Uh, as you can see, we have a fork flipped in there. And what we used to do is we used to take this fork and adjust the width of it to match this, the root ball of the tree that we were dealing with. Now, the root ball was covered up in burlap, so it was really important to get it right so we don't rip it up and make it look terrible. Now, in picking it up, it is really important to make sure you go really slow. I was never the one picking them up. <laughs> it was always Nick doing that. But um, when you pick them up, a lot of the trees, they tend to tip, they tend to like twirl around, and they can be pretty dangerous. So usually, my job on the ground was just holding them in forks to make sure they're not going to get damaged or they're not going to fall. Once they're picked up, it's a really slow crawl to the trailer, and then it's pretty much in reverse order where we just drop it down, lay the root ball on the trailer, and back it up. Well, me or Peter or some other of his associates would hold the tree in place so it didn't move or it didn't fall. And then we just block it up and make it, you know, pretty sturdy. Because we didn't want anything to move around in that trail once we started going 50 miles an hour down the road. Now, as for storage, what everything needs is that, like, trees, for example, you're going to need a lot of water to keep them going throughout those hot summer days. Um, and then, obviously, for, like, some of the smaller plants, they don't need so much water, so they can be, you know scattered around, but you want to keep them gently in the same area. Now with the smaller plants, you really want to pay attention to what kind of species they are, because some plants cannot take that much direct sunlight, especially like in the morning or anything like that. So you want to make sure that they're well stored so that like they have around six hours of sunlight per day, because you don't want them to get all burned up. And you want to make sure that you can get you know easy access to and then as for any like non-living things like bricks, flagstones, or anything like that, it's just really important to keep them in a good place where you're not going to bang them up or you're not going to break them. And then like anything like wood or anything like that, you want to keep that. So next up, we're going to talk about actually getting the job done. Okay, so first off, you need to establish kind of a crew. Now this can consist of masons, trimmers, or other ground personnel. And another ground personnel basically means anyone that's going around with a pruner, anyone that's digging holes, basically anyone that's, you know, not really conducting some of these really bigger jobs like masonry or trimming the actual plants up. Okay, so now we're going to go up to a little order of things that me and my mentor discussed. Uh, so first off, you want to have everything on the property. That's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, then, once everything's there, you kind of want to manage your crew. You want to make sure everyone's doing, knows exactly what they're going to be doing, because you don't want any confusion. And then you want to make sure that, like, everyone has a certain task. And then next up, uh, for the, when you're actually kind of starting the project, you want to make sure all masonry, or all, like, anything having to do with, like, rock work or anything like that, you want to make sure that's done first. Okay, because this can be a messy task, and you don't really want to get in the way. It's a lot of heavy, heavy stuff, and those people typically get pretty mad when you get in your way. Okay, and then after that, what you want to do is you want to plant all your shrubs and stuff. Uh, first off, you should really plant any trees, because those are big, and you got to wheel them around. You want to make sure you're not crushing any small plants. After this, you can put in all your tiny flowers and all that, and you can make everything look pretty. 
And then project depending, depending on what kind of plants you put in, you want to go ahead and then after everything's planted, you want to make sure everything's well fertilized or watered. Now, this is a really important step because like once you put a brand new tree in without like proper fertilization or the, you know proper amounts of water, that tree can die pretty quickly. And then what you want to do once all of these steps have been taken care of is that you want to take care of any of the land that has been disturbed by the project. Now this includes things like laying sod, seeding soil, or covering up anything with hay or repairing any ruts. Now typically when dealing with you know, one of our most common disturbances in the area that we usually dealt with was making any ruts. Now usually what you want to do is like a little dance over the ruts and you want to make sure they're nice and flattened out, okay? Because uh, when the landowner comes back, <laughs> you don't want to have like World War I, you don't want to have trenches and, you know, <laughs> throughout, their, uh, throughout their property because that, that just doesn't look good. Okay, and then after you're done like repairing the earth and going through and taking care of all these little things, uh, you want to make sure that you do a lot of finishing touches. And this can consist of like any pruning that needs to be done. Any, you know, small touches that need to be done to enhance the overall image of the project. And then after that, of course, you got to safely clean up everything, you gotta make sure everything goes back in the trailer. You don't wanna leave tools around. And you most certainly don't wanna, you know, have a tractor falling out of a trailer, because that <laughs> just ain't fun. And then after that, you just wanna leave. And then, <laughs> well, this is actually an important step, believe it or not, because the crew, well, in my opinion, in Nick's opinion, the crew shouldn't really be around when you're discussing finances and you know, payment options. So you really wanna, you know, crew gets out of there, job gets done, boss comes in, Boss talks. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, and then after that, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of some landscaping projects that I have personally done or my brother has done. Now, first off, uh, this is my dad's garden. Um, so, kind of the process behind this one was going through and taking out all this dead material, and that's really important, especially in this time of year, uh, because everything dies over the winter, of course. But you really want to make sure all that's taken care of. You want to make sure that you get all the roots out of the soil so nothing really comes back. Now, as you can see, sort of, right here, uh, we planted a couple small, small flowers. After, we put in a large stone, large upright stone. And then that was kind of the project over with. Now we're going to be going throughout this, and we're just going to get all the And the next thing that you'll notice is that this is a newly planted tree. Now this is pretty significant because of uh, some of the finishing touches we've put up around it. So it's not only just about digging a hole, dropping a tree in, putting some dirt back over, and then leave it. You really got to put in like any wood chips or something around it to cover it up to hold in the moisture. And then typically what you really want to do is, because trees can start leaning, they can start bending around, you really want to brace them. And we did a lot of, we put a lot of sticks in the ground and we just tied the trees off. And you have to make sure that you're not tying them too tightly to the tree trunk because you don't want to damage it. Now this is another example. Uh, this is kind of before we even got it in the hole. And specifically about this job site is uh, I remember digging one hole one day, put the tree in that one hole, and then left. And we got a call a little bit later saying that they wanted the tree moved. So we had to go back and actually move the tree. And that was kind of a pain in itself, but and now this is a great example of putting in like a walkway or some sort of steps. Unfortunately, I was not here doing this job because I was working in a different area. Uh, but essentially what they were doing, my brother and Nick, were really putting in a nice flat steps all the way down to the lake, as you can see. Now, to do this, what they did was this pressure-treated wood that lines all the steps and stuff, all that had rebar in it. And the rebar was, I think, around one to two feet deep, and they just pounded it in. And then they went back and they filled up all the steps with some nice, you know, flat stone that they could pound down and actually make it really nice and flat. And at the end of the day, I think that they did very well. And that's just, you know, these are just a couple of examples about how landscaping can really enhance the overall image. Okay, so now let's go on to some of the field research that me and Nick did. Now, when I first came up with this project, we decided to go with 
we, we took a look at a war memorial down here, and we looked at it, and we were like, hmm, we think we can do better, and we think this needs to be more of a centerpiece for Grassberg. Now, in order to do this, what we first did is we first went around all the towns of Vermont, kind of, and um, we took a look at their war memorials to see what we wanted to, you know, kind of take from them. Now, two of the main ones that we went to, and some of the best examples of this, now this is not really a pretty slide, so I'm just going to skip right over it, and I'm just going to show you. But two great examples were, first, the Morrisville Memorial, and what we really liked about this is we really liked that it was a prominent location within the center of town. And it was also like a really inviting area. You can't really quite see it behind this, but behind there is like a playground, so it's a very nice, inviting place. So what we kind of took away from this is that we really wanted to make our war memorial a really inviting place. So it's really nice and, you know, well taken care of. And then unfortunately, uh, these pictures were taken at the wrong time of year. But surrounding, uh, you can't quite see in that picture. But beyond this statue is a ring of a bunch of different walls that have all the names of all the fallen. And surrounding that is garden beds with different types of shrubbery and other, you know, potted plants in key positions. Now we really like this idea about integrating kind of like a nice walkway with, you know, definitely some putting in some flowers and definitely, you know, having shrubs. In it. Secondly, and one of my personal favorite was a hardwood memorial. So on the picture on the left is a really nice picture of the overall image and aspect. Uh, but notice how the masonry kind of makes makes it feel more of a grand experience. You're more, it's more welcoming and it's more like honoring to be there. Now, in the middle picture, not only can you see this beautiful, elegant wall, which unfortunately we cannot do here, but this beautiful wall, you'll notice that, and then below it uh, is really nice masonry with a nice carved out, you know, centerpiece. We really loved that. So we really wanted to incorporate some sort of masonry, some sort of pathways. Now also, this is another picture of shrubs. Unfortunately, they're a little bit burned, but um, you'll have to understand that these photos were taken within the last couple of weeks, because we didn't really want any snow to be in the photos. But, so really important takeaways from this is the masonry, and then we wanted to make sure that these shrubs look really well, because we don't want shrubs to look like this. We want them to be nice and pruned, nice and straight, and nice and uniform. Now for a little conclusion, what does it take to actually be a landscaper? Okay, so first off, you gotta have the right kind of equipment. Because if you don't have the right kind of equipment, you're kind of useless, all right? <laughs> now, um, <laughs> a next really important thing about landscaping is the communication aspect. So first off, you wanna be able to really communicate with your crew, you wanna make sure that you can tell them everything that they need to do. And the other aspect of it is you really want to be able to communicate very well with the landowner or the person that organized the project. Because, you know, if you can't communicate well, things fall through, you just can't execute their plan, or they can't tell you what they actually want, or you're unable to tell them what's actually feasible. Now, another really important thing is you really want to have an outstanding imagination. Now, this comes in handy when you're actually out there with the landowners, you're taking a walk across the land, and you can point out like where everything goes, you can kind of really vis visualize it in your head. Next off, you want to have a really well-versed knowledge of plant species, because, I mean, you can't be a landscaper without knowing your plants. And then you want to have an understanding of the way colors and height affect the overall image. You know, this is some more basic aspects to actually doing a landscaping job. And then, Following up with kind of the communication piece is you really want to be good at organizing. And this not only applies to your crew, but also your materials, because you want to make sure you're well organized there, because if you're not well organized, things get lost, things get damaged, and you'll lose kind of revenue because you're losing those materials. And you have to go back and buy more and all that. And then another really important thing, you want to be really you want to be really safe. Because landscaping is can be a dangerous job. You know, you're dealing with not only sharp instruments, but you're dealing with heavy machinery, or you're dealing with really heavy plants. 
And I can tell you that there's been more than a few days where my back's hurt at the end of the day. So you really want to be safe because you get hurt pretty easily. And then the last important thing is you want to make sure that you have a great work ethic. Because no one's going to want you to do a landscaping job if you just can't actually do the work. You want to make sure that you're, you know, you're seen there. You want to make sure you're doing all the work and you're doing it to the best of your ability. Because you really want to make, at the end of the day, when you hand them the bill, you want to make sure that they're happy to see that bill on how many hours. Well, not happy to see the bill. No one's happy to see that. <laughs> but they're going to see the amount of hours that you put in, and they're going to like really appreciate how much work you actually did. And then finally, I want to say a couple of thank yous. Uh, first off, big thanks to thank Nick's... Uh, Nick, <laughs> sorry, you'll have to forgive me. I'm a little, still a little bit nervous. Yeah, this is some guy. Um, but special thanks to Nick, my mentor. He's been kind of teaching me the ropes uh, for these past couple of years. And then a very big thanks to Stuart uh, for teaching me all these, all these things that I know today, and especially for you know giving me the opportunity to work and like, actually do some pretty amazing things and have everything be really beautiful. And then I would also really like to thank some of my teachers. Uh, Mr. Butte, thank you very much for you know, sticking with us and helping us with our senior projects. And unfortunately, he's not here, but uh, Mr. B. Pleasure. Mr. B has been really understanding of all of us seniors, and I think he deserves a really big thanks because he's pushed back assignments and all that, because he knows that this kind of stuff is really stressful on us. And then lastly, I would like to thank my mother and father. Uh, not only for being my parents, but also um, for all the days that we spent outside in the garden, all the landscaping, well, landscaping jobs that we've kind of done together, all the times that I've, you know, went up to Maine with you, Mom, and we planted those trees, or we went into your garden, Dad, and the rockery, and actually made it, you know, turn from a mess into something really beautiful. So thank you. And then lastly, I would like to thank you all for coming here today and listening to my senior project. Thank you.